progress. Yeah, sorry, it's it I thought it had started already, but it's going now. Good afternoon. This is a meeting of the Conservation Commission Land Use Subcommittee. It's July 18, approximately 12 p.m. And we have with us Michelle Lobb, Bruce Stidman, uh, commissioners and Amherst employees, Aaron Jock and Dave Zomack, who uh, we always welcome to our meetings and they provide um, valuable input. We have an agenda today to address any comments that have come in from other commissioners on our draft agricultural policy, um, to talk about draft policy topics that might be ready to go to the commission for their review. Um, the agenda number three was hunting on conservation land, safety and compatibility. And number four was dogs, an issue that we have talked about in our last meeting and then items for future meetings. So um, I'd like to start by asking if we've gotten any comments from commissioners on the ag policy. I've seen none. Um, I am supposed to be speaking with Rachel. Uh, she had a couple questions just relative to the ag policy and the ag exemption under Wetland Protection Act. Um, but I think that was sort of an offline conversation as opposed to submitted comments. Uh, I'm mindful that when we um, delivered the ag policy to the commission, we didn't give them a deadline. We just asked for comments. And it might be helpful if we put on the agenda for the next uh, full commission meeting to bring that up and give them some sort of a deadline. And so um, assuming that people would agree to that, I would ask for ideas on what deadline you think is appropriate. I mean, I think a couple weeks is reasonable. Um, from the time we gave it to them or from the time we have our next meeting? I think the latter, if we're going to drop a deadline on them. So could that be in July? That we, that we, our next meeting, CONCOM meeting is in July. So <laughs> that, that would put it to the middle of August. Yes. So we have a meeting next week. The agenda has already been posted for the 24th. Um, and then our next meeting after that is August 28th. Um, so, you know, a couple days. I mean, I think even if we announce it to them on the 24th, then the next meeting we would have as a commission would be the 28th of August. Um, and we should probably talk about our meetings for August for this committee as well before we sign off for the day. Okay. Um, well, it may not be specifically on the agenda, but there's always an item on the agenda for issues that came up within 48 hours of the meeting. So maybe there's opportunity to slip it in there to just give them a deadline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. And that, you know, I don't, I don't have any, um, um, too long a time people forget too little time is uncomfortable. So uh, I heard two weeks from the next CONCOM meeting. Okay. Do we have agreement on that? Sure. Okay. And then um, I, uh, the next item was, if we're done with that, we'll move on to item two, which is draft policy topics regarding commission review. And um, I had hoped to go through, I think forestry is ready. Uh, I think public, uh, community gardens could be ready, but I think we need more discussion about that. And um, there are a number of other items that could be ready that aren't uh, involved in long and so on. I do not have a list for you. Doesn't, are we done with community gardens? Haven't we? Tied that one up? No, we're not. We haven't tied it up. I got back uh, edits by Aaron, and um, we haven't talked about those. So, 
So the edits from me were just um, from our meeting with town staff. So like sitting down with Angela and Stephanie, and it was basically just breaking out the links to the applications um, for each of the different gardens and then just a little background on the uniqueness of the um, uh, Fort River Farm because it's uh, in a different sort of organizational structure than the Amethyst Brook one. But that was that's the extent of my edits, just administratively distinguishing those two and having the links be separated so people understand there's a differentiation between the two garden organizations. Yeah. What we asked for was comments from the people that manage the gardens. We got them from Aaron. And what the comments are is a perpetual uh, link to the website. So it essentially backs this the CONCOM out of rules. And um, um, that, those gardens are on Conservation Commission. And I'm not, I think we need to talk about um, as commissioners what we want our relationship with the community gardens to be. Um, I understand that they were formed a long time ago and I'm not really prepared to talk about them today, but it bothers me a bit that the way the rules are set up is to uh, just refer people to the website for the current rules and back us out of deciding what those rules are. We have, as people have noted before, the Conservation Commission has um, I'll call them ownership responsibilities for CONCOM land. And I know of no agreement where we have delegated that to somebody beyond the commission. Michelle? So haven't we gone through the rules as a subcommittee in depth at this point? Like I, I was comfortable with them and then and then we sort of understood that the management of the gardens within the conservation land is delegated to the certain individuals and sort of a um, a group. And maybe, you know, as long as we agree on the rules of ongoings within the garden and that we're comfortable delegating the management of that to the community garden group, maybe we could get like an end of the season report memo or something from them to get a report on how it went if they had any deviations of concerns things like that so that we're staying in touch and we remain connected to it but we're acknowledging that they're you know running it i guess just an idea now, the fact that we're having this conversation tells me we're not done so i would suggest we put it on the agenda for a future meeting bruce well, I just, I guess my question is whether we're done enough that we can seek input from the rest of the, of the commission, and then we could just deal with uh, this management issue as part of whatever they come up with. I mean, they... I'm good with that. Like the, I think we've talked about the rules explicitly enough, and then the just the management aspect we could deal with later, but. I'm I'm good to hand that out, move it on, move it forward. Okay, so let's let's um I'd rather put it on a agenda rather than take up time because we're gonna have a lot of time on dogs today, rather than I'd rather put it on an agenda for another meeting and um and just have it as a topic for discussion. I yield to the chair. You happy with that, Michelle? Sure. I, I mean, I still think we can move it forward, but um, maybe discuss specifically the last item of how we interact with the management of it as a subcommittee. So it doesn't have to be reviewing the entire rules again. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So um, number five is items for future meetings i didn't put community gardens on there but i would i would add it can we move on to quickly talk about hunting on conservation land that was one of the items that um, um is near ready for commission review but we've we we have issues of safety and compatibility which i wanted to talk about quickly and um 
um, we have 80 miles of trails on conservation land, or so the, the town website says. That's a lot of trails. And um, um, there are potential safety issues and compatibility issues with hunting on conservation land, which I think we should talk about briefly before we um, um, send this issue to the commission. And I've raised in the past that it's in conflict with our mission statement, which the first word of which is protect. So I just open it up to people's thoughts. Do, do we have a draft document on hunting or not? It's been quite a while. I don't, I may have missed that circulation. I'm, I'm looking at all your recent emails and I didn't see it, Alex. I didn't send it out. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, let me just. Um... Have we talked about hunting? I, I thought we had like a, like a five or ten minute conversation about it. Under the, item, the... the item is called hunting and uh, fishing and hunting, and it's actually in the same document that I pulled the dog stuff from. Um, oh, from trustees. No, or... the, our rules. If I can share my screen, I can show you. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, you should be able to share, Alex. If you can't. Um, Down at the bottom, is there a little green share button? Oh, I got to go back to the Zoom. Ah! <laughs> um, yeah, share screen. Uh, Oops, wrong document. Did I lose you completely? Nope. We just can't see your screen, but we can see you. Oh, I can't see a thing and my monitor is off. Ooh. There you go, you're back. I can't see you. I don't have a screen and my monitor is, is, uh, there we go. Turn my monitor back on. Hold on. Mm. Ah. Just not getting any signal. I goofed. Well, Alex, while you're doing that, I just want to ask Dave, what's the, I'm looking at a document from last fall and you commented that there was historically a popular, what you call put and take, which I assume means catch and release at Pupper's Pond. What's the status of that? Are you while you're, uh, excuse me, while you're talking about that, I'm gonna log off and log on again so that I can renew my entry into the Zoom. I'll be right back. Sure, so that reference, Bruce, was actually to fishing, not hunting. Yeah, not talking yeah. about fishing. Put 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 and take fishery in in most states refers to the stocking of fish ah. and the taking for sustenance that people take the fish home and eat them, and mm. so for decades, uh, Amherst Conservation, the town of Amherst, has encouraged a put and take fisheries in the Mill River, the Fort River, the Cushman Brook, uh, and Puffer's Pond. Um, so that is a, you know, an, a well-established practice for decades. What gets, what gets stocked? Um, trout, rainbow trout, um, rainbow trout, brook trout, tiger trout. Those are the three, typically. Um, historically, we've had fishing derbies, fishing tournaments at Puffer's Pond for children. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, All right. Very so. curious. So I guess my question is, are we still doing it? Are we still doing <laughs> what? Talking in the, the derbies and all of it. Uh, we, we don't, we don't stock 
the pond or the rivers, but the state stocks of her spawn with thousands of trout every year. Um, and, and also uh, the Mill River and the Fort River. It's pretty common practice throughout all of Massachusetts. Oh, okay. And many people do, you know, you, you know, fishing at puffers is a very popular mm -hmm. activity. And uh, many people, not all, but many people who fish there are putting food on their table. So they will catch the trout and take them home and eat them. Okay. And likewise in the mill and the Fort River, Fort yeah. Rivers. Yep. So Alex may be having connectivity problems. I'm not sure. So, um, just to carry it one step further, is would you say that for the most part, that the difference between uh, uh, fishing for and taking out uh, stocked trout? that the people who do the fishing know the difference between that and the wild trout run that still exists and that that you that is catch and release. We do not we have do. we do not have any policies in, in Amherst about catch and release. Okay. The only um I rarely use the term native. We have very it's it's I would say we have naturally reproducing brook trout in some of uh -huh. our streams. They are probably not technically native trout, but they're naturally okay. reproducing and people can take them home as well to eat we, them. We can come back to this later. Yeah, if we're gonna talk hunting. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna share my screen. Hope this is the right one. There's a way to make it a little bigger, Alex. That would help me. I don't know about others. You can hmm. see the oh, this is the agenda. The agenda, yeah. Um, I'm going to press stop share. That's what I did before, but that's that goofed up. That should work, right? So that then I stop sharing. Yes, okay. Let me go. If you can continue to talk about fishing for a minute, I'll try and break up that document that uh, has hunting in it. If it doesn't work, Alex, you could also send it to me and I could pull it up. Yeah, I've got it here. I I just got to. Um... While Alex is doing that um, one after the last um, discussion that we had, which I recall being really short, um, <laughs> I did some GIS analysis on setbacks um, for various um, sort of like hunting regulation related setbacks to determine where, for example, um, from a regulatory standpoint, there would be issues with people hunting in town. Um, and I might need to adjust some of that based on the rules because that my understanding of the rules were different than um, the land manager. So like in terms of what the setback requirement was from public ways, for example, Anyway, um, I, so I need to just do a little more research into what the actual regulation is in terms of the setback from a public way for hunting. But um, based on what my results were from my analysis, it was completely in line with what the policy was that was on our website, which there was like certain designated properties where hunting was allowed. And when I did the analysis, those properties came up as the ones that were outside of that setback location, meaning that from a state, from the state law standpoint, those would be, um, you know, under state law, if we looked at state law by itself, those would be locations where people could hunt legally. Right. For instance, while we're waiting for Alex, uh, Atkins Flats 
has clearly has the setbacks necessary for um, from a state standpoint in terms of safety, whereas Mount Pollux wouldn't, you know, as to contrasting, just comparing and contrasting. Um, and those areas were set up by my predecessor, Pete Westover. Again, they had extensive, extensive meetings on hunting uh, attended by over the years, probably hundreds of people. Um, not to say we, you know, and again, uh, Aaron's more recent analysis is is very helpful. I think that's one of those things that she and I have referenced as if we can kind of work on our policy, we can then create, or Aaron has begun to create the supporting documentation for the policy, i.e., you know, what are those areas that do have the proper setbacks from homes and um, residences and businesses and uh, public ways, roads. Can so, you see fishing and hunting now on your screen? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know who went first, Michelle. You're muted. You're on mute. The setbacks are not have nothing to do with the trails in the property, right? They're just residences and businesses and stuff. Um, and I was just wondering, based on your setback analysis and then the, the places that have been designated okay, has that been pretty consistent with how people use them? Have there been any reports of people hunting where they shouldn't be? Or just like, what's how does compliance feel with all that? Um, I would say... Um except for an, a very occasional blip on the screen. One recently we had uh, down at uh, Brickyard, you may recall the gentleman who had contacted us about hunters uh, being too close to his property line. I believe it was off of uh, uh, near the Brickyard conservation area. It's very rare these days, Michelle, for me to get or us to get concerns or complaints. It does happen. Um, but but it's maybe twice a year, three times a year, if if that. Um, so they I, are allowed at Brickyard or they were allowed at Brickyard? They are allowed at Brickyard, but the hunters in question, I believe there was, the, it's, I'm a little fuzzy on it now. Aaron was involved in that too, but I believe also they may have walked in on private property uh, we then got, there's some water supply protection land down there, and it, it got a little muddled in whose property would belong to whom and what were the rules and regulations. But I would say by and large, we don't have many, many problems. I will say um, there are from time to time hunters who uh, practice with their hunting dogs, for instance, with rabbits. Uh, and they actually do training on conservation land. And I think somewhere in the verbiage, we we reference that. I think I just saw that somewhere that it's in uh, the dog. It's in the dog rules. Dog so. section. Yeah, I just saw that there. Um, so this section, fishing and hunting, hunting and fishing is per permitted where we're not posted. Hunters and people fishing must be licensed and abide by all Massachusetts and federal fishing and hunting regulations. So, you know, I, I think the practical the practical application of this is if the commission is comfortable, we should be we should be doing a better job of posting those areas that where hunting is allowed every year. And yeah. All other areas, if we can't post all 2,000 acres, no hunting, but um, we can we can put that on our website and put it on social media, et cetera, et cetera, during the hunting seasons. But we would need to post those areas where, where hunting is allowed to also let others know, hey, if you're walking down this trail and you hear a gunshot, it is allowed at Atkins Flats. For instance. Yeah, so one comment about that, Dave, is um, first of all, your comment, we cannot post. There's that 
I would strike that from the conversation because that's that's you just made a decision. And well, that, it's that, let me let me correct myself. It's very challenging to post two thousand acres of land and I keep understand it that. post. And I understand keep, that, but that's not a reason to not not go forward with this discussion. I never said anything about not going forward with the discussion. <laughs> We're having the discussion. And then the second thing is posting that you can does not mean you can't. We're not posted. The law in Massachusetts is if you don't want somebody to hunt, you must post and, and they specify how far apart the posting must be. Mm -hmm. and somebody must post their entire property. They can't just put it at access and so on. There's all kinds of rules. Yes, so, I'm well aware. Yes. Yeah, I know you're aware. But yeah. so posting that you can does not imply under the law that you can't anywhere else. So I just want to clarify that for one uh, second. Uh, because... uh, could I, before you jump in yeah. there, and I think there's also a clear distinction, though, between public land and and private land. I think the commission can say, you cannot hunt. We could list every area where hunting is not allowed, and you could list every area where hunting is allowed, and I believe that will suffice. I okay. could be wrong on that, but go ahead, Aaron. I'm sorry to jump in there. Yeah, I was just going to say we're we're going by state law here. So if if we're saying you can't hunt here, it's because lot setbacks, like setbacks from roadways or setbacks from residences, restrict hunting under state law. If that's the case, we don't have to post the property no hunting because the individual who's coming should know that that particular property does not meet the state standard for being able to hunt there, if that makes sense. It's not us saying, oh, this property is completely accessible and, and legal under state law to hunt on. If that's the case and we're saying no hunting there, yes, then we would have to post it. But if state law would preclude them hunting there, I don't believe we have to post it. Okay, Michelle. Oh, sorry, Bruce, I usurped you. Um, yeah, what, what Aaron said exactly, because there's multiple criteria to allow post uh, hunting. So it's posting plus a setback. But I think that the way it's written is confusing and sort of um, implies that most of the places are open for hunting. So I think adding some affirmative about where specifically they are and then everything else isn't because of the setbacks would be. Bruce, you're on mute, Bruce. Okay, moving on. So I want to come back to my original comment that hunting is contrary to the mission. The first word in the mission is protect. Killing things doesn't protect them. So we have an issue with our mission, regardless of state law. And I don't think there's anything that says that state law trumps our mission. So um, that's a we either we need to deal with the conflict between protect and and allowing the take of animals, and that that's that's contrasting to not allowing dogs to change the behavior of birds by you know walking near them. Um, so there's um, there's a there's a a bit of a conundrum here between allowing the, the killing of animals and I I have this discussion I mean this is um, I mean I teach hunter ed and uh, I've held hunting licenses my entire life so I'm dealing with the words in front of us not my personal feelings um, so I I feel some need to deal with the conflict between this and our mission statement. And so far, the mission statement would lean towards not allowing hunting. In fact, it would allow for uh, not taking fish. That one's a harder, a harder issue. The other thing is, I believe you can discharge a firearm in Massachusetts within 500 feet of a building. So there's a there is a safety issue. Um, 
uh, with with buildings and Aaron's talked about setbacks, but we have 80 miles of trails. And um, um, and we're building more trails. Um, so I put that out for discussion. Aaron or Bruce? So I just wanted to say that, um, you know, there are there are not really that many native natural predators for a lot of animal species and looking at deer for example that you know deer become overpopulated they run into roads people hit them with cars that there yeah. is some element of hunting that that keeps populations healthy and so mm -hmm. i would just counter that um, protecting yeah. might include natural sort of population control to keep things from getting, you know, disease and um, I got you know, it. people getting hurt. Yeah. I'm a trained wildlife biologist and I'm not going to buy that. I, I go to, I go to St. Andrews, New Brunswick, and there's deer walking down the street. Um, so I understand the population control argument, but that doesn't, that doesn't square with the conflict of our, with our mission. Bruce? Well, personally, I, I would uh, like to see no hunting anywhere in the town, but um, I also think that, that the idea, the word protect is a very high order 50,000 foot aspiration. And it doesn't seem to me that um, it requires disallowing hunting everywhere. So I think as long as we were really careful about where the hunting happened, it was safe. It was within state law. I don't feel the same uh, conflict with the mission that Alex said. Uh, Dave. Yeah, I would. I would echo Bruce's um, comment just now and. And I, I guess I would, I would take it a step further. And you know, I may not get the words right here, but the word "protect," um, frankly, if if I take that to the nth degree, um, I I would say that um, if you know, I, I I could I could I could find equivalence between hunting, fishing. Uh, frankly, the damage and the impact that dogs have on our conservation land, um, and frankly, the the creation of trails. Um, right. We we should stop building trails. Frankly, we should close some trails. The more impact that humans have in the interior of of these parcels, by and large, I believe it's a negative impact. I uh, think they, were, they bring were... dogs. They bring trout. We, I'm sorry, not they. We we bring. Our, our families, uh, our, our trash, our, our, our smell, our scent, our dogs, our everything. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I struggle a little bit with, a, with kind of a very strict definition of protect. Um, and, and I think there are some, some arguments to be made around, um, um, you know, but anyway, I'll stop there. Yeah, just to comment on that, I could, <clears throat> you could take protect to the population level and then it gets you away from the individual level. Um, and you could talk about, you know, protecting the population. Mm. So um, I can, I understand that. Um, and I would agree with you that there, the zone of influence around trails is tremendous. Mm. For all, everything that happens on trails, there is a a large zone of influence. Michelle? Yeah, and Dave said it very well. And Alex, I agree that with the population interpretation of protect, like maybe that can resolve our you know, internal conflict with it. Um, hold on. Uh, Is Sorry, I just had to shut off my alarm. Um, the last thing I wanted to say was in regards to the question of permitting hunting, um, I just wonder if Amherst population and trail use increases over the last, you know, 10 years or so warrants a discussion about allowing it. And just because 
yes, there's setbacks from houses. There are more houses now, but there's also more trails and there is, they don't really, I don't know how they get equated into um, these, the places where that, where places are allowed, where hunting is allowed. But I have been on Atkins flat when people are hunting and it's not the greatest feeling to be in an open landscape with guns. Um, I mean, we left, but just just sort of taking stock about where Amherst is population wise, trail use wise, where the trails are, where the new trails are going and usage and whether or not hunting on these conservation lands or which conservation lands still make sense for the safety of trail use. Yeah. That, that said, I'm not against hunting. I just, you know, Amherst is a city now and maybe we need to just take stock of where we are now versus where the we were the last time this bigger conversation was had. Mm -hmm. Bruce, makes, makes that sense. was sort of my question too, Dave, with that, at the risk of prompting another big round of public meetings about it. Um, what would you say in general that has there been a shift in attitude since the last time this big round happened before you got here? Hard to say, Bruce. I, I, I don't think I have enough Okay. information. I, I will say that I I like where Michelle was going, which is is kind of saying, okay, you know, it's a good time, 24, 25. Let's take a look at those areas that Aaron has identified as meeting the setbacks for the state requirements um for, for roads and 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 homes, et cetera. And let's let's evaluate those and let's take a look at those in 24, 25, right, you know, topically now and, and see what we feel. I will say we really we have 80 miles of trails. I have not created I have purposely not created a lot of trails, even under pressure to create more trails. So we have acquired some properties where I have just said we're not building any trails there. There may be some bootleg trails, if you will, but but I've tried to limit the new trails we've built. Hickory is an exception because of the unique nature of connectivity there to neighborhoods, et cetera, et cetera. But we have not built that many new trails in my ten during my tenure here purposely because of the zone of influence that Alex spoke of moments ago. Um, so anyway, I'll stop I'll stop there. But I think it's a good time to take a look at those those polygons and say, hmm, Atkins Flat, Eastman Brook, um, Brickyard. Hmm. Uh, you know, let's take a look at those and say, what's changed? What's, you know, are there new houses? Are there, you know, whatnot? So. Or even putting a buffer around trails. That would yeah. be really hard to administer, but putting a buffer around trails. A, a, yeah. pers a person, you can discharge a, a shotgun in Massachusetts, woodcock hunting. And, um, you know, a shotgun goes a long ways. Uh, if mm -hmm. you look at the people who, I think it was down in Belchertown, people were having bullets, um, um, pellets from shotguns from a, from a rifle range, <laughs> cracking their plate glass windows. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a, a, a gun range down on the, on the Holy Oak range for which I'm a member, uh, where people sometimes complain about for noise, but um there could be people legitimately hunting birds on conservation land right off trails and um they're supposed to be mindful of what the backdrop is before they even put the rifle or shotgun to their shoulder but mm -hmm. um uh, things happen so uh, i would yeah i think looking at the polygons would be really good if, if aaron is able to do that alex could i ask you a question yeah. Um, not being a hunter, I do fish, but not being a hunter, you mentioned rifles and, and could you say a bit about that? My understanding is Amherst may already prohibit hunting with a rifle in town. We have, there is some prohibition on the books about the, the state prohibits the use of a rifle. It allows the use of a, uh, black powder, I'll call it rifle. Uh, which has no rifling. Uh -huh. I, I own one. It's a 50 caliber firearm. Um, but, you know, it could put a pretty big, it's a big, it's a 50 caliber slug. And yeah. it, goes, it goes a long ways. So yes, there is a prohibition against 
weapons with rifling. And I'm, I use the wrong word. In Amherst, in Amherst. Statewide. We, we have something on the books that is tighter than state law, I believe, about rifles. We, sh we should look into that. Oh, you can't hunt in Massachusetts with a rifle. Hmm. Okay. Only a shotgun. You can put a slug in a rifle. I mean, in a shotgun. Okay. And oftentimes deer hunters will use slugs. Okay. okay. So okay. Um, where we are with this, I think it needs some more thought. As I hear that Aaron uh, has been asked to come up with the polygon map. Is that doable, Aaron? Yeah. And Alex, um, <clears throat> while I'm looking at it, um, and I, again, I was working off of what I thought was correct. I have um, a 500 foot setback from a structure and a 500 foot setback from a from a public way. Um, does that sound accurate to you as far as? Just from general memory, yes, I haven't. I haven't okay. I, yes. Because I, that's what I knew from my research, but I, when we met, with the land manager, he thought that the setbacks were smaller than that. Um, and, and it was interesting because when I ran the analysis, the analysis came back with exactly the same properties that are listed already on our website as the ones where hunting is allowed. So it seemed like, oh, I'm on the right path with this, but I wanted to just check um, if that seemed reasonable. So if we're looking at trails, what then would the expectation be for a setback from a trail in terms of like how far well if um, we if we went with 500 feet that's in key if 500 feet is right and we can check that just going to the links that are in, in front of you now on the screen um assuming 500 feet is right then it's logical to put the same buffer on a trail but that and if you're using a bow um the risk probably goes down um People can't use crossbows unless you're handicapped. And um, uh, most bow hunters are um, a different situation. And I think in terms of safety between that and firearms. Okay. Uh, but okay. but 500 feet doesn't do you much for safety with regard to a firearm. But I, I it would be difficult to come up with a rationale that's different from what state law allows. Yeah, I mean, just looking at the map and the trails, I can tell you that if we do 500 foot setback from the trails, it's gonna um, mean like, for example, on the Holyoke Green, there would be no hunting um, other than maybe Sweet Alice. Um, there would be quite a bit of restriction also in the Lawrence Swamp um, other than like, you know, if you're deep into where the so, wells are. Um, so, you know, the, the GIS map we're talking about is for our discussion. So maybe you could give us the buffer with public ways and, and residences. Is it buildings or residences? Either way. Well, I did structures, um, to be totally honest. And, and the reason for that is because I have like a structure layer that was constructed in GIS that just shows where all structures in town are. And I can't go through and distinguish what's a shed yeah. and what's a house. So I just built it off of the so structures. Could you give us two maps. One is the public way and structures. And then give us um, uh, uh, public ways, structures, and trails. And see where we come out. Just for discussion. Yep. Yeah. Can, can I also just um, put a plug in for, I know information can inform policy, but I just want to make sure we try to stay in the policy realm here. And for lack of a better phrase, are we, are we chasing a solution for a problem what what is the problem what is the identified problem or issue we're trying to solve here historically we have not had issues with uh with safety and hunting on Amherst conservation lands i i understand michelle's comment notwithstanding and i and let's look at that but i just want to make sure we don't go too far down this this rabbit hole and stay in the policy, which I think we all kind of agreed earlier was 
or at least there was i don't think we've strayed from that dave yeah but but i just want to make sure we don't spend too much time on the the mapping and all of that and stay in the policy of what is our policy regarding hunting i think the map thank you for your comment but i think the map yeah. helps us inform our discussion mm -hmm. and, Agreed. um there there um there uh, people enjoy the out of doors in different ways and when I was in grad school, one of the things that I did a lot of work on was conflicts of use, public use, um, multiple use conflicts. And there, there are, everybody should have an enjoyable time on our conservation land. And if somebody's out walking with their kids and somebody's dragging a dead deer with blood on it past them, trying to get it out of the woods, that um that may be contrary to somebody's sense of their enjoyment in the out of doors um so how we balance all of that um one of the ways to do that is to separate the uses and so coming up with a gis map that puts a buffer around trails there may be areas that are so dense with trails that if you put a buffer around them there's very little opportunity to, you know um, um for hunting yes. outside the buffer and that would be useful to know no I, I i agree i think i think having aaron put that together i think she probably already has it uh, i will just add i know we're short on time but i will add that again my comment is you know we we by by data, we we don't have a problem with hunting. The number one conflict on Amherst trails by a thousand are dogs. Yeah, there yeah. is no question about that. And we nothing... have spent our we have spent our time yeah. more time than I thought on hunting, and not had enough time for dogs. So um, yeah, and we've got eight minutes left. So um, I appreciate the fact that by a thousand dogs are a bigger issue. Um, if I will say that if in this town, which is different than some, if you put on uh, the ballot a question before the Amherst citizens, do they want hunting on conservation land? I'd put a hundred dollars on what I think the answer is. If it went out to the public. And I, call, I actually called the police department and asked for the duty officer to tell me if they got uh, questions or complaints about people hunting, and they didn't recall. I mean, I think there's a good chance that hunting is very low in Amherst, as your experience is. Yeah, so, so. Um, are we, do we have an issue? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I haven't found any reports that we have issues. Uh, is that a reason to not address it? I don't think so. So right now we have a right now we have a policy that says it's open everywhere. We're not posted. That means everywhere. And um, you know, within Mass all Massachusetts and federal hunting and fishing regulations. And um um we're just dealing with that and it warrants I think by this, before we go to the commission at large, uh, I think we need to talk about the four corners of this issue. So if it's okay with folks, <laughs> if we could leave this for now and wait for Aaron and put it on the agenda for our next meeting, um, that would make me happy so that we could uh, figure out what to do with dogs in the future because we're not going to have enough time today and then figure out uh, w what we want want to talk about at our next meeting because i owe it aaron an agenda bruce i was just gonna say that it, this and many other topics in this subcommittee are about balancing you can't please them all all of the time and we just have to work on finding the right balance for each thing yeah, and that's an art. Um, that's an art. And, um, and just like dogs, 
um, if you read the verbiage, I'm going to switch the dogs, but if you read the verbiage, the three paragraphs that I wrote, there are people that enjoy the out of doors in different ways. And there are people, Michelle's one of them, who don't go to places because of their experience with dogs. And that's that's a very unfortunate. And if we could avoid that kind of stuff um, uh, by what we do, uh, that would be great. So I, I'm i going to switch now to the 10 things that we came up with last time. <clears throat> we did a lot of work in the hour and a half. For next time, if you would um, look at the what's now 12 items and um, try and I don't want to wordsmith these things, uh, but I would like to identify, um, I would like to move us in the direction of drafting something for the commission. And um, if somebody wants to take that on um, to better our dog policy, and um, then, then that would be welcome. I'm not sure we're there yet. But for next time, if you could look at the 12 things that are listed and come up, divide them up into three groups. And I just pick three rather than saying prioritize all of them. If you could put them into high, medium, and low, considering whatever criteria you want, <clears throat> ability to implement your sense of success, whatever your personal point of view is. It doesn't matter, just whatever your thought is. And divide this list up into three groups, high, medium, and low, in terms of um, implementation and 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 um, probability of, of success. And bring that to the next meeting. I would appreciate that. And what list are you referring to, Alex? The list of 12 things? I sent out a draft uh, on June 25, and I forgot where I stored it. <laughs> and, and Michelle wrote back and she says, I think your list covered it all. And I said, yeah, I'm trying to find it. And I did find it. So I modified it and it now has 12 items. And at the top it says drafted June 25 following some committee's first discussion of an hour and a half on the subject. And it was revised today by adding item 11 and 12. So if you could go down through those and from your own perspective, I don't really care what that is, but just group them into three groups. Um, if if we were to come up with some policies and some advice on going forward, um, um, some of these, almost all of these have to do with administration. Um, um, and they're not really at the policy level. So, um, we need to deal with that. The, it's it's Dave's group job to administer. It's our job to point a direction. And and you're talking specifically about the dog uh, list of ideas for addressing dog issues. Yeah. Okay. Because it was I received a bunch of emails from you that day, so I wasn't clear on which one you were talking about. But I I don't think Dave was copied on that, so I'll forward him that email yeah i'm seeing a list with only 10 things on it so i don't think yeah I have the there's another email there with it is that i sent out after that because i gave it some thought and i pulled the trigger too soon it, Dave, I'm, I'm forwarding it to you sounds good thank you so what the the, the, the things i added dave is um if not already occurring from prominently post on the town website dog walking policy and education at key times of the year, seasonally, such as seasonally heavy trail use. Um, kind of like when you post no swimming at Puffer's Pond, maybe we could mm -hmm. have something up there about dog walking and, and as, as it's an education tool. The other one was to coordinate with Amherst and Hampshire College and UMass to have dog information in the orientation packages that go out and perhaps more effective means of communication. I don't know what they would be. I just, yeah. but we've got a large population of people, some of which have dogs that live off campus and use the trails. Yep. So there's yep. another, I, another place to communicate. I like, I like the list of 10 that I saw, so. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to sign off because I've got a meeting at one and I have to run to 
take a break before I um, join okay, So in. I'm going to write up an agenda for the next meeting for Aaron. And we're putting uh, dogs, dogs, hunting. And the way this group goes, we'll be lucky to get through those two things. And um, thank you. Can I end on a positive note, Alex? Uh, uh, just the social media wise, um, we put up some new benches that were partially made by a volunteer and we put them up at uh, Mount Pollux yesterday or the day before I'm blanking on which day it was. Uh, there are three new benches at the summit of Mount Pollux and then one about a quarter of the way up for those people who may not be able to make it up. And they were uh, designed and made, we, we, we took some liberties. We we copied a little of what the Kestrel Trust had done for some of their benches. And Steve Locke, who's a Amherst resident, helped the conservation department build them. And uh, it was on Facebook and um, um, uh, Instagram. And so got a lot of positive comments about them. And great to have some nice, well-designed benches up at Mount Pollux. And, and yeah. we're going to try to populate some other areas with benches. They cost about $120 each. And they're quite robust. So we think we can kind of mass produce these and get some seating areas at conservation areas where people might need to sit down and take a little break under a tree or whatever. So well, check it check it out on social media. Yeah. Well um, I okay. I Bruce, you had your hand up. No, I have to go. So like okay. Aaron. Bruce, um Dave, I had a uh, if you can hang on just for a second if Bruce has to go. Sure. I went to Mount Pollock after the big discussion about the wedding. Mm -hmm. And I I was curious because we thought Mount Pollock was such a delicate site. And uh, I went down there and I think it's not very delicate. Um, the town mows a swath of about 20 feet uh, from the parking lot to the top. I saw no trail beaten down by people going up there. They seem to spread out as they walk up. Uh, I didn't see any erosion. What I did see was um, the the condition of the railings around the parking area. Right, they're slated slated for uh, replacement this summer. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, and the mowing in some some areas you can't see the railing. So, yes, they. Uh, I I was up there. I think yesterday or the day before. Um, yeah, th that's been completely uh, weed whacked around those existing poor in poor condition, but existing bumpers, I would call them. Yes. Yeah, because so the, the impression I got from looking at the condition of the bumpers is that we're not paying attention. And uh, if they're going to be um, uh, um, addressed, terrific. So they'll probably all be removed and we're probably going to put up a split rail fence there uh, six feet back or so from the, from the edge of the bituminous. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's all been weed whacked uh, new benches at the top. And as I said, uh, one near the bottom. Um, I, yeah. I don't know where anyone got the impression that Mount Pollux was delicate. I certainly, I missed the last meeting. I, I would not call Mount Pollux delicate. I, would say that it is mm, um the parking is very limited we do have a trash issue up there we do have some activities like all places but that's prone to drinking and drug use actually uh periodically so we do have some partying that goes on there so i think i would i would characterize things more as it's a popular place and it can get um yeah it just can have some impacts and some activities that we're not fond of up there well the time i walked up there was a birthday party going on mm -hmm. people had carried chairs and a table and a trash bag and it was lovely i bet it was lovely yeah and they were yeah. having a great time and i thought why not doesn't bother me a bit they're not hurting the place and there were actually other people up there enjoying Mount Pollock who were off, you know, sitting on the grass, having a great time. The party was not interfering. There yeah. Small, 
small we- small weddings up there, small birthday parties. I have no problem with. I think, yeah, I think we get a little from an administrative standpoint, a staffing standpoint when when we get into weddings, you know, of 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 some demand like, oh, we want to have fifty people up there. Where are you going to park them? Oh, oh, we have we have people we want to drive up to the top, and you know, then it gets into wow, that we just don't have the the staffing and and the support to do bigger when, events up there. When you have that many people, then sanitary conditions uh, exactly are yes, concerned. exactly so. So, so I, yeah, I I agree with you. It's um now the lower reaches of uh, uh of Mount Pollux down in the orchard, I believe, but I have not looked up this in quite a while. I believe uh it may there may be some estimated and priority habitat on the lower reaches of Mount Pollux in the the big hay field down there, and I believe um uh it is box turtle habitat. So that is the only species of concern if you will that uh I, I that is known to to use that area yeah so so yeah well, um it's a lovely place it is gorgeous and, um there were there were commissioners who on a number of occasions have have felt personally affronted by um or excluded uh by people having uh an activity down there and to me, I mean, I, I kind of, I, I hear that. I don't share it, but it is such a wonderful place and so unusual. You know, if that's people's way of of um, connecting with the out of doors, uh, um, so be it, and let them. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's all scale. You know, we can't do big weddings there, but if you've got twenty people and you're willing to carry some chairs up to the top and have a quick ceremony and you can you can uh a carpool up there um we did i i wasn't at the last meeting i know that laura when when we allowed the filming of the movie that is now at the Emerson cinema you may recall i'm not sure if you were on the commission at that time alex but we allowed filming of a movie and laura uh went up on one of the days they were filming the movie and was not treated well by the film crew, almost the film crew saying, you can't be here. And Laura's like, this is public land. I can be here. And so I know that Laura, there may be others, but I, I know Laura had a very, you know, unfortunate and negative experience with the, with the, with the filming crew. And yeah. I think it was, it was probably uh, some young uh, grip or no, I don't know what they call it in the film industry. Somebody who was charged with intercepting people coming up the hill and saying, Hey, we're filming right now. And didn't probably didn't have the right words and the right, you know, the right skills to say, could you hold just a minute or, Oh, you're a commission member. Sure. As long as you're standing over here, do you mind being, you know, we're, we're shooting right now. So she has, she has carried those feelings forward forever. Yes a couple of years forward and here now the movie is out and, and yes, there are some shots in the movie. I'm told. Yes. I'm you can go see, see, you go see go. the movie, even in the trailer, Mount Pollux is featured in the trailer. Yeah. I yeah. just heard an interview with the, uh, the gal who um, stars in that on, on, um, on the radio. Yeah. Anyways, I, I just, okay. uh, there were commissioners talking about, chair the legs of chairs digging into the ground and oh yeah no i i, I, I wish i i wish i had been there that that is not a i wish, I wish they would go up and take a look yeah uh, um it's a it's a pretty robust old orchard and uh you know you, you you worry about the drinking you worry about you know drug use you worry about fire a little bit up there but um and night use but it's a pretty robust area. There's there's no wetlands up there. There's no rare species on the lower half. I believe there are some wood turtles that that walk around down there from property to property. But other than that, it's a pretty it's a pretty robust old orchard. And it's and it's it's rare amongst our conservation land. Yes, beautiful views of the Mount Holyoke Range. You know, 365 days a year. So I I um um. I mean, I'm a person who loves to go out and sit in the woods still for a couple of hours and see what what happens. Mm-hmm. 
and not be moving and let the world move around me. I am personally bothered by people with their outs with their you know, loud voices. It, but I then I said to sit here and say, that's just how they they interact. They think they're having a nice outdoor recreation experience. I have a master's degree in outdoor recreation and the psychology of it all. And uh, it's different than me. And I have to accept the fact that people interact in the out of doors in different ways and enjoy it in different ways. And that's 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 why I wrote the thing about dogs, the three paragraphs, because there are there are people who just flat out enjoy walking their dogs on conservation land. And yeah, and they the have as much yeah. right to do that as people without dogs. Mm -hmm. And our yeah. job is to try and minimize the conflicts. Exactly. So yeah. um, balancing all of that is a is a challenge, and and it's a challenge that I willingly take on. I thoroughly enjoy trying to trying to do that. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I just thanks for. Right. The, I just wanted to say my reflection sure. about Mount Bollocks. And yeah, and, and check it out. Um, uh, it has been mowed. It has been weed whacked. We are going to replace the uh, the 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 green bu old bumpers up there and uh, parking bumpers and uh, the new benches are are being well received. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. Yeah. Same to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.